All right. Hi, and welcome back to Tome Travelers. We are going to go ahead and get into the second part of our first show, which is the character creation for Babylon 5. Essentially, what's going to happen next is I am going to walk my wife, Roxy, through the character creation process for Babylon 5. Now, this is a D20 game, so... Yeah, it's based off D&D 3. Yep, so D20 system from that era where it had the, you know, the white and red marquee little button on the front of each of the books. A lot of this is going to sound familiar if you've ever made a character for some of the D&D games out there. But so the first thing that we're going to go ahead and do, uh, just because this is a good point to start off at, is we're going to go ahead and roll stats. Now, because this is a D20 system, it's got your standard stats, your six stats, which are strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. But we're going to go ahead when we roll the stats just to kind of streamline things a bit and make this a little bit easier. What we're going to do is we're going to roll 4d6 and we're going to drop the lowest dice and that'll give us a good value between 3 and 18. Are we re-rolling ones? Uh, let's not go ahead and re-roll ones this time and we'll just go ahead and do straight rolls and that'll give us a good idea. A lot of tables sometimes go for the re-rolling ones so you have an average character. Some people will even do re-rolling one too, but we'll go ahead and just do it straight roll this time because that'll give us a wide range range of stats to work with all right so my first roll is 13 okay two five and six uh, my second roll drop that one is a five six and four so i'm looking at 15 oh that's good four six and a one so a uh, 11 okay and drop that one it looks like a 13 13 Drop the one for a four, four, and a three is an 11 again. It's a pretty good character so far. Nice average stats with some higher ones. And four, six, and a three puts me at 13. Wow. Yeah, kind of an average character with a couple 15s, I think you said you had. I had one 15. One 15. But everything else is a 13 or 11. Wow, yeah. So, I mean, so there's going to be still something that the character is Still a really zero, though, right? 11s uh, are zeros. 11s right? are zeros, and, but that uh, 13 is going to be a plus one. By the same time, that, that kind of feels like a first level character right. in D20 system. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All right. So the, no, I'm fine with that. So I would ask at this point, going forward with the character, what kind of concept you have for them? Well, based on our discussion that we just had, and uh, remember, audience, that I have a very limited knowledge of Babylon 5 as a whole. So trying to create a character that would fit in this world is a little difficult for me. Trying to... Um, because I'm kind of just cramming on what I'm reading in the book and what I remember. I am going to build a Centauri, but my character type, and I'm trying to see if this is even really plausible with their social structure, but I was going to build, uh, since I'm a little bit more familiar with Star Trek Deep Space Nine, mm -hmm. I was going to try to build a Quark, the Ferengi merchant. I, I think that would be definitely possible because both, both those races have kind of a leaning towards power accumulation as well as yeah, political the Centauri, Yeah, the Centauri, according to this, they delight in scheming and politicking, and Centauri society provides rich opportunities for both. So they're almost mm -hmm. more diplomatic in the schmoozy political, yeah. not diplomatic, bureaucratic, I think might be mm -hmm. the word that I'm looking for. I don't know. Yeah. They're more... Well, they have almost a uh, Renaissance European, or even if you're playing Seven Seas, Vidachi kind of sound to them, where they are very much a political power that they like to wear velvet. <laughs> Right. Well, they like names and ranks and titles, and most belong to one of the great noble houses. Those without such standing are often sold as slaves uh, among the nobles, though a few find their way into the stars. So would being a merchant be... It would be possible, because I mean, this is a society where that kind of job would be fulfilled, and it could be that, you know, especially being a first-level character and whatnot, perhaps you have gone to Babylon 5 to make your claim to fame to start accumulating power that you are doing basically what Quark was doing and using the position and the location as an opportunity to grow. Okay. So, so yeah, that's kind of my idea is uh, I'm going to be shooting for a merchant who likes to show himself as somebody who is able to get fine things, okay. collect the finest art maybe not merchant is the right maybe merchant let's say maybe an art dealer or okay. something oh, like yeah. that where yeah. they're dealing in the finer things okay. luxuries that the nobles 
of Centauri used to bedeck themselves or their homes or whatever to yeah. present themselves as as more more than maybe they really are, yeah. but part of their society is built that way. So Yeah, absolutely. So more than likely this is going to be a character that is less physical. This yes. is going to be a character that is more social. And so it comes down to a question of how are you going to do what you're going to do? Are you going to be intelligent? Like uh, you've got one stat that is higher than anything else. Are you going to shoot it into your intelligence where you try to outsmart people? Is it your wisdom where you have a greater amount of knowledge than other people? Or is it your charisma? Is your charisma your strong well, point where you try and manipulate or are inspiring? Well, to well, since looking at the stats or looking at the racial traits, Centauri already get a bump on their charisma. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably reserve my charisma for one of the lower numbers because I get a natural bump. Okay. And then save my big one in the event I get something that's knocked down. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and start that part off. Yeah, so, so I know my strength is going to be an 11 because I'm a weak. I'm a weaky. <laughs> uh, my dexterity, I'll put my constitution at a 13. Okay. Since it's kind of my middle of the road number. Yeah. I am going to bump, I'm going to keep my intelligence at a, if I put my 13, if I put another 13 in intelligence, then I'm going to get, no, I get to keep that. So I'll keep that there. It's my wisdom. If I put a 13 in wisdom, it drops. Two. it's going to drop down to 11. Okay. So I don't want to put an 11 in there. I'm not even sure I want to put my 15 in there. Or if I want to keep my 15 as something I might. Do you think dexterity would be something that someone with a social... It would help if you see yourself as ever getting into a confrontational situation. Because dexterity is going to be your ability to avoid damage as well as do ranged damage. Which is a big part of this universe. Yeah, I kind of like the thought of my decks bumped up. Perhaps maybe I have... Now this is my... This is my uh, fantasy mythos uh, kicking in, but perhaps I have a history mm -hmm. and uh, can pickpocket or something like that. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no. So I'll put a 15 in my decks, mark it off. I do get a plus two to my charisma. So if I put a 13 in there, I get the 15. Mm -hmm. That leaves me with an 11. Ooh, no, 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 no. Do I want to do that? Let me take out that uh, 13 in intelligence. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make that an 11. My wisdom will then be 11 because it's a minus. Two. I would rather have everything at a... Makes sense. I don't know. That might be a bad move, but that's what I'm doing. One, two, three... Four, five, six, seven. Well, that's one thing with the D20 system is know your strengths and play to them. Yeah. Oh, do I have too many 11s in there? Wait a second. Did I do something dumb? Oh, did I see. I did my math. All right. So I'm at strength 11, dexterity 15, constitution is a 13, intelligence is an 11. Do you think I should swap my constitution and intelligence? My only reason for having a little higher constitution mm -hmm. was in certain situations, I'm assuming, and, and you can tell me if my opinion of constitution is a little skewed, but I kind of foresee a lot of perhaps imbibing and yeah. drinking. And I would like my character to not necessarily be as easily affected Absolutely. by small amounts of alcohol or even large amounts of alcohol. Yeah. Well, and that's one of those things where imbibing alcohol or anything of that nature, your constitution is going to come into play. It's going to affect your hit points as well. And it's going to affect your ability to deal with poisons. Okay. You know, then poisons I, I, deal with I'm, I'm happy with my intelligence being a little lower and uh, I'll just... Yeah. It's one of those things where it really comes down to the individual. A lot of people, in that play d20 more than i do they say that you always want to put a good number in your constitution regardless of your character build right i myself i usually tend towards just doing an average number in there but that's just me i mean it's yeah. always up to the person and how they are going to play the character yeah okie dokie i will go with that so it says so now you have your racial things that'll add or subtract to it right and so i have the minus two in wisdom and the plus two in charisma so that puts uh those stats at 11 11 and 15 respectively okay uh so yeah uh so you said 11s or zeros 11s or zeros do we go ahead and do that now is, is it okay it is, to start yeah. working on the mods now or at this point in this system uh they did not really make it to where you're going to get anything that's going to affect it it, it didn't look like it so yeah. and a 15 is a two a 15 will be a two and a 13 is a plus one plus one all right so yeah i have three zeros two plus twos and a plus one. Excellent. So now comes the fun part. I mean, we've got your character, we've got your race, and we have your class. Right. So the classes are, a, there's a small highlighted section at the end of the races that gives you the list of classes, or we can just go ahead and piece through. Well, and, and this looks like it has favored classes. Favored classes come into play if you're going to have a character that multi-classes. 
Okay, so let me see if I should be uh, right get, here. Yeah, there you go. Okay. The eight character classes available are agent, diplomat, lurker, officer, scientist, soldier, telepath, or worker. Mm-hmm. Not an agent. No. Diplomat is a possibility. Possibly. Uh, lurker is also a possibility based on, uh, depending on your what you're trying to do. Uh, I will say diplomat would also probably give you a greater amount of resources at start, though, versus that. Probably. Telepath, definitely not. No, I'm not a telepath or a worker or a soldier or a scientist nor an officer. But agent is a skilled operative in the employ of a corporation, government, or military organization who performs much of their dirty work. Only if I was, you know, this was like... agent at the crown kind of thing. Perhaps, or I could even see kind of being like a... Like, uh, my, my business is my cover. Oh, yeah. It's my, it's my face, but I'm actually gathering mm-hmm. information or, and it puts me in a place where I'm meeting and glad handing with a lot of people because I'm on this diplomatic space station, but I'm also, and so I have an opportunity to, you know, when it refers to dirty work, you know, I could commit espionage or assassinations or. I guess it would also come down to possible differences in the skills that each group has because. This is an older D20 version. I know in 5th edition, they have made it to where almost everybody has access to the same skills to some extent. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some that they not everybody has. It all depends on where you put points. You know, 3rd edition, they really hardline limited you to skills for your class. Right. And anything beyond that would cost double. If you wanted a skill that you normally wouldn't have, it was going to cost you double points. What is the armadillo looking race? Quite honestly, I don't remember. There are so many. Uh, it's it's that. Does uh, it suffer from Star Wars where it's, it's just. Star Wars can't see in a scene. Just throw in a bunch of prosthetics and see what people pick up on. Yep. All right. If they really uh, like it. We'll create a backstory for it. Apps. Yep. Let's go ahead. Would I mean. Does diplomat fit? That's 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 where I'm having a hard time is mm-hmm. is and this I, would be this would be where I would say the system is very restrictive. Yes. Um is it because Babylon 5 would not have place for merchants? No. In fact, there is a location called the Zolico on Babylon 5, which is basically this gigantic market. And a lot of the scenes in the series take place there. In fact, there is a bar that is very much everything like Quark's bar. Okay. So, and the, yeah, I guess he owned a bar, didn't he? Yeah. He wasn't necessarily just a merchant. But. And so the, the, it is a restrictive system, but again, this is the fun of D20 is that you can always pull in things from other systems that might fit better as long as the terms and use can be assimilated to some extent. And if you have a DM willing to work with you and whatnot. But so in this system, what I would say is that it might be better not to look at the terms as a official titles of any sort, but look at them more as a behavior. Mm-hmm. I mean, does your character have an agent-like behavior or does your character have more of a diplomat kind of behavior? Even though they might not be a diplomat of the government, is their business kind of that diplomat kind of thing? Yeah. That's what that's where I would come at it from. If not, agent might also work because agents also are deal makers and rule breakers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to determine. Like, I'm reading the diplomat thing and seeing if if what they're looking for. My my thing is is you know you, you're saying you can bring in this stuff from other places. You can tweak but obviously it. Obviously, we don't have that at the table. Well, the the purpose of mm-hmm. this portion is can we use the book? Yeah. To create the character that we want that we think would fit in Mm -hmm. the setting and at the moment it feels like you can't unless you make some serious concessions let's see um this is because the diplomat is is purely looking for i mean it it refers to like couriers and attaches and things like that yeah okay so yeah for class for class i think i'm going to go with i'm going to modify my concept Mm -hmm. a little bit and i'm going to go with the uh, agent i gotta find it again second lots of page flipping yeah and i will say that about this book especially when it comes to character creation Mm -hmm. that's one of my peeves with some series out there is that they put a ton of fluff at the opening of the book that the players don't always need and it can really slow down character creation but because they have put you know a lot of games have put it right at the front it makes it to where your players can come in create their characters and not have too many of the secrets that you might want to reveal to them in the game as the game goes on right right. i kind of like this layout Okay. See, my thing with the um, the agent, I wouldn't necessarily, like, if we were actually playing this, mm-hmm. I don't think I would want anybody to know that I was an agent. Yeah. I think I would rather they thought of me as a diplomat, but based on the, like I said, based on the wording of the diplomat, it feels very difficult to try to, I mean, it's 
it's very mm-hmm. much, you know, politics and stuff like that. And that's where obviously the desire for more books comes along because you get those other books coming out that'll end up having more classes and giving you more opportunities mm-hmm. and it creates more of a demand for the player. But they never did any more books, correct? Oh no, there's there are Oh, is it their whole stack? Set? Oh, okay. Of books from this company. Now, I don't have all of them. I did get the Zillico book because I, I, of course, want to have the book that has all the items and equipment in it. Oh, okay. Well, for this, for this, for the purpose of this, I'm going to go with Agent. I have it titled on my sheet as a luxuries dealer. Excellent. Okay. So, with the Agent, if you're on the page, there should be a table. There is. There is. Always with D20s. And so, at first level, there should be a base attack. Mm-hmm. And the base attack is My a... base attack bonus is a big whopping goose egg which is interesting for an agent because you would think that there would be something more at first level but obviously this is not going to be the equivalent of the fighter so they might be trying to think no of it more as yeah like, you know. it it seems it's more not necessarily covert but you know for instance it says in this capacity agents may work as negotiators representatives spies thieves or assassins as required by their employer so you really so somewhere fulfill- between Bard and Rogue. I mean, yeah. So, so. A plus zero on that. And obviously, there are going to be saving throws, which we can go ahead and kind of gloss over for the moment because we're not going to be dealing with that part so much. Okay. Uh, but you should have other things that are going to come along at first level. Does it give you any uh, character bonuses? Um, I get a special. Okay. The only co- the only additional column is special. It's a security systems, okay. which it says um, looks like is a class skill. All right. Or it's under the class skills header, and it says agents may use the search skill to locate security devices and systems when the task has a DC greater than twenty. Okay, so that is definitely a rogue like talent. Where kind of like in third edition, the rogues could find traps. You can find all the things that are security systems going into a location for your team. Right. Again, it feels kind of weird with my concept, but I'm going with it. Yeah. And this is what we're trying to work through. The question is, can you make the character that you want using the system? So, all right. We have that. And then you should have, in the character write-up, there should be something that tells you your, how many skill points you should have. Uh, skill points at first level. Six plus intelligence modifier times four. So my intelligence modifier is zero. So I have 24 skill points. And there should be a skill list there. Mm-hmm. And Well, no. No? Uh, well. And more than likely, it'll be at the front of the skill section. Yeah, I think the skills... Usually they have like a short write up on this at the top of the class and say these are your class. Well, skills. I have that. I have my class yeah. skills. The Is cl- that what you meant? Yes. I thought you were because I think most of the skills they're pulling straight out of the D and D book. Okay, but they some of them are different. Some of them will be different. Yeah. Okay. There's the skills table. Okay. There you go. And so it's important to pick out skills, obviously, that will better reflect your character. And because this is a D20 book rather than an OGL book, you might actually have all the skills written out. I do. In the book. Yeah. On the skills table, which is about almost 20 pages later, it most of them look the same as your standard D20 or, or um, you know, your D&D or your Pathfinder. Computer use is obviously new. Concentration? Uh, concentration is your ability to maintain like well your, your, i understand yeah. what it is but i don't think concentration is a skill in dungeons and dragons not in the editions that you've played this is usually okay. in fifth edition you all roll like a savings throw in third edition you could actually build up concentration as a skill for when uh say you're trying to cast a spell and somebody hits you with a sword okay yeah in fifth ed you have to roll to see if you keep concentration exactly. and it's a type of save yeah, yeah in, in third edition they made it a skill which you had to buy up in addition to your save okay now they so, do have drive in here as opposed to ride mm-hmm. um read lips the one thing about third edition is that it was super skill heavy so that was a skill in in third edition read lips yes <laughs> okay i mean y- later on you had pretty much only one skill that you needed in order to sense something okay but back in third edition you had search you had spot Yep. And you had to listen. Yep. Each one of those was a separate skill, so you could be good at each one of those or not at one of those. I mean, it, it made it really interesting, but it also... You could hear little... you could hear really well or pick out something from... Exactly. But, or find something. Not be able to Maybe see. you, you know, because a search is about, like, the static search for an object. Spot is looking for things at distance. Things of that nature. Okay. Um, yeah, I, the other ones that I see that might 
be specifically new to this telepathy and technical would medical have been a medical was not heal was the uh, heal skill. was the check okay yeah there's yeah. no heal in this but forgery mm-hmm. i assume that would have been a uh... i'm not even certain to be honest uh because i mean it's been a while since i've done third edition there were a lot of i mean there this is what a lot of people kind of griped about. When third edition went to fourth edition, you lost a lot of skills. They combined a lot of skills in order to streamline the game. Mm-hmm. Now, when Pathfinder did it as well, they streamlined a lot, but they kind of gave a lot more explanation, and you really didn't feel like you were losing as much. And fifth edition kind of found like a balancing ground between those two concepts. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's so it streamlines what what you need to know. Mm-hmm. You have a certain thing, and you don't end up having to look up or waste skill points points or wonder because one of the big debates for everyone is is it a spot check or is it a search check what am i needing to do right now okay okay yeah no it it actually says that the skills table is the exhaustive list of the skills that they add Mm -hmm. that are described in this book and any from the player's handbook that are applicable they do not allow use of any other skill that is not on this table so yeah i mean you don't want me to go through and oh no pick all my skills for the (laughs) not really but let's see how bored we can make our <laughs> me trying to pick skills but so 24 skill points and the reason that's done was pathfinder your class skill you get you get a plus three bump right off the bat mm-hmm. to your skill and that gives you a little bit of a bonus to say hey i'm trained in this mm-hmm. in this game in pa- in uh D third edition you didn't get that bump it was basically you get your attribute bonus plus however many points you put into it up to a maximum before at first level oh, okay and so you had to you had to earn every last point but 24 skill points that also makes it very long and hard to do character creation yeah that's a that's a lot i mean if my intelligence modifier had been anything else i mean you're yeah it it grows exponentially and so if you're playing like a really smart character you're looking at you know possibly up to seven times four so 28 character points right off the bat if not more Mm -hmm. and so yeah it it can make character creation take a long time at that era of gaming now at the same time for a versus a point by system this Mm -hmm. is still faster right but yeah you can see the the positives and negatives of using the system right there yeah 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 Sorry, my starting wealth is 1,200 credits. That actually sounds pretty good. Yeah, 3d6 times 100. So two fives and a two. All right, so what's after skills? Well, usually with skills, we would look at your character's defense. We would look at uh, your character's savings throws. But we really don't need to go that far in depth per se, but one of the things that is going to also always influence a character creation for the d20 system would be feats. Right, okay, let me... And so this is, you know, feats are the things that truly make a character special outside of its class. Right. And so with... Wow, I didn't even know. I didn't realize that I found the languages part. And the... There are three different forms of Minbari. Minbari dark, Minbari gray, and Minbari light. I actually don't even remember all that. It says Minbari dark, feek is the language of the warrior caste. Minbari Gray is Adrento, language of the religious caste, and Minbari Light is Lenna, language of the worker caste. Wow, I had completely forgotten about the caste system. Because, you know, they, they, only, they only go to Minbari a few times in the series mm-hmm. to where you actually interact with all the different groups. Right, okay, so let me see here. So that's skill. So then, yeah, it goes straight into feats in the same chapter. Mm -hmm. And so with your vision of doing an agent, but a character that is a dealer of different things, this would be the point to find, if you couldn't get a class that did that, this would be the point to find if you can do that through feats. Mm -hmm. Because, again, third edition didn't have backgrounds. Right. So, I mean, Pathfinder, you have your different traits that can build up your character towards a certain goal Mm -hmm. and in fifth edition D&D you have a background that would give kind of a backstory to your character to where you could say this is what they did or this is what they do and in in third edition in games based off the D20 module it all comes down to feats Mm -hmm. so do you see any feats in there that kind of capture how many how many do I get does it say you're first level and you're not human so you get one Okay. Yeah, this has the the same the same kind of line. It's um, the following feats from Chapter Five of the Player's Handbook are used without change within the the Babylon Five role playing game. So they list all those. Mm-hmm. So it's got some of the familiar ones like um, far shot, quick draw, rapid shot, run, two weapon fighting, weapon focus, improved trip, 
stuff like that. Yeah. And then, but it's got a massive list of feats, including racial feats and telepath feats. Telepath feats are out. Yeah. Racial feats, maybe it depends on if I find any that apply specifically to Centauri, and I kind of don't really kind see of any doubt that it. Out at you. Well, one of the uh, as far as feats that might have jumped out at me, contact. I was gonna okay. look it up and see what that meant. What, um, so this again is going to be one of the fallbacks or the issues that you're going to have with a d20 game especially dealing with feats mm-hmm. is that it comes down to what kind of dm you have it's character creation a lot of times you can justify a lot of stuff and if you have a good dm that is interested in the story side of stuff mm-hmm. he might be able to say or look at you and say okay based on your character backstory and everything else this is what you're going to have you're going to have this business and you're going to have recently set up shop and here's all these things and we'll go ahead and go at it from this angle Uh, but without (laughs) that feat some of the more hard-edged kind of gms out there they will instead turn around and say well if it's not on the paper you don't have it i could uh as a centauri i could have the feat of prehensile tentacles that's always fun i'd have to be a i'd have to be a male which i'd already anticipated but it just made me laugh but no contact i think is probably where i would lean For my first one, just because you know the value of friends and favors and have cultivated one particular relationship in order to provide you with great benefits. And it requires a charisma 15 plus, and so I'm already sitting there. But yeah, there were a couple. Noble birth, but... I wasn't going to go with that one. Mm -hmm. But so kind of getting in there and finding a feat that almost works to some extent, at least gives you a backstory. And I myself, I'm a story based. I would say, okay, you have a shop. Here's what we're going to do with it. Right. And that would be something you work out with me. But like I said, and you know DMs who are like that, where they are very much, if it's not on the paper, you don't have it. Right. And that's, that's unfortunately a good point to close out on with the D20 system with this. Mm -hmm. You know, after character creation. And that is, does the Babylon 5 system set out to do... I mean, do you feel like you could make a character based on the source material? With with my limited knowledge, within reason. Mm -hmm. And I myself, I would say... I, I would actually say no. And the reason I would say no is based on... The character that you're going to make right off the bat in this book is going to be a character that I would I would consider a red shirt. You know, using the Star Trek term, but not using it as the joke, as the cannon fodder. I, I'm saying that this is the character that is in the background. In Star Trek, you know, there is Captain Kirk on the bridge, and then you've got all these other people that are nameless characters that seem to wander by and do their own thing and are part of the crew, granted, but they're not part of the show. Babylon 5 had the same thing with, uh, you know, with Garibaldi, with Ivanova, and these characters, they, they were the big wigs and they were the, the focus of the show and there were all these people that worked around them and under them, but you really didn't get their story. The story was always about these bigger people. And so this game comes along and D20 system, you're making a first level character that would not be the principal characters of the show. Yes, you're playing in the universe. Yes, you're, you're getting this opportunity to be a part of it, but you are not the principal character. Right. Now, I think there are greater systems that do this better, obviously. The more cinematic style systems that are coming out now. I could see something based off of something like by John Wick or the 2D20 system that Modiphius is now using. Yeah. Where, you know, Modiphius, right off the bat in the new Star Trek games, you can play the captain, you can mm-hmm. play the doctor, you can play the security specialist who leads everybody you pl- you're playing the crew that everybody looks up to right and your yeah. your npcs you can you can call on essentially first level red shirts yeah exactly to to accompany you as part of the system and you have a ship in this game like i said there there are those gms who are like if it's not on the paper you don't have it yeah what do you have and so that that's that's probably the drawback of a d20 system and this system now we, we've done a little research on it and we have heard other people say that there are issues with the game where the stats that you get for the races don't really match up right and i kind of wonder about that because the stars of Babylon 5 were not the normal kind of characters for their race. Right. They were kind of exceptions to the rules. Yeah. You had the, you know, the Centauri leader, Molari, who is the only character that is as, sh- he's like the super shiftiest, most amazing politician in his race, the way he comes off. He's the only one with his accent in the entire show. Nobody else ever shows up with the same accent he has. 
which looking at Star Trek and the leader of Spock's race with uh, Plow or T'Pau. T'Pau. She again <laughs> doesn't have the same accent as Spock, but she's their leader. So maybe it's one of those things where like an entire planet, they're going to always be yeah, different I, accents. I, yeah, if you, <laughs> we just watched the the episode where Spock goes through Pont Far, but... Yeah. Uh, there's the, I always uh, either say, I, I flip it. Sometimes yeah. I'll say fun par. But there's the Narnam <laughs> bot Baster, and he's actually really diplomatic for his race. You look at the rest of his race, and they want blood. They want to just, you know, Well, yeah, according to the book, else. their blood rage is their racial feat. But he's more of a politician and likes to work behind the scenes and pull strings, and that's very atypical for his race. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, what's the race that Dylan is part of? The Minbari. Yeah, the Minbari. And she is definitely an atypical Minbari. She even grows hair halfway through the series or something like that. You know, so it's one of those things where maybe to some extent, a lot of the races were given kind of stereotypes based on the overall image. Mm -hmm. But you really don't feel like the, the races in here stand for the characters you know. Yeah, the argument that I had read when we were doing some research was was specifically that based on the show, they one of the focuses was the Minbari racial traits and penalties uh in specific they felt that they focused too much on the membari being xenophobic where this individual the original poster felt that like delin and other people mm -hmm. that you see commonly on the show yeah delin was not could be could be could be very charismatic and shouldn't have to hold to that negative two penalty yeah. on charisma. Yeah, in fact, the only ones that were really truly xenophobic were the warrior cast. So that's, you know, that looking back at it in my mind. Now, of course, when we have, whenever we do our little Babylon 5 thing down the road, uh, maybe I'll look at it a little bit more, but yeah, uh, that's, that's what I remember. That's one thing. I would uh, be interested after we watch Babylon 5 again to look at this book again and kind of see. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to say that it's that it doesn't have the spirit of the show, which oh, is no. what the gentleman that I read online was kind of his opinion was it didn't feel like it captured the spirit yeah. of the show. I'm not going to go out and say that because J. Michael Straczynski was very active in the development of this book and it's it's his mind baby. So yeah. um, it, what may, maybe the show didn't capture his vision entirely. I think it did. I'm, I'm not saying it didn't. But if you're having trouble finding the spirit of the show in the book, and apparently there was a second edition that that mm -hmm. we do not have. Yeah. But and apparently in the second edition, they did tweak some things and made people a little bit happier. But maybe maybe that was it. Maybe it was just a bad publish. Something yeah. got pushed out. But I mean, Matthew Sprang was the guy who wrote the, the system itself. Uh, J. Michael Straczynski gave his blessing. That's pretty much the idea. You know, it, it is good. I, I, will, I will say I would not have bought it if I didn't like it. And it definitely captures the Babylon 5 mythos. Okay. You definitely get the idea that, yes, you are in the Babylon 5 universe. Yes, you have all this that you can work within. But does it capture the show? Not really. Okay. And so for an enterprising GM, maybe you can always bump up the character level a little bit more. Maybe level 5 or level 10. And that way the characters feel a little bit more in line with everything. Right. But yeah. Okay. So anyway, that is the end of our first follow-up show with character creation for Babylon 5. We would like to thank everyone for listening and of course Nerds Domain for giving us support and everything. We hope to see you back for the next one. Thank you very much. This has been a production of the Southgate Media Group. For more podcasts like this one, head over to southgatemediagroup.com.